Um, first of all, thank you all for attending. This is the August 3rd edition of the Team Unstoppable Call. Uh, we do these calls um, every week or so to talk about topics relevant to real estate and real estate investing. And I'd like to start off with this slide just to remind people the goal here is not to be perfect. The goal here is to learn. Um, I remind people that I'm not dangerous because I never lose. I'm dangerous because I'll never stop. I'll lick my wounds, pick myself up, and pick, uh, carry on from there. And that's uh, to me, that's the road to success. Uh, the um, We're going to cover in reasonable detail in the next hour or less if I can cut it down a little bit. Um, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, most of you know that I do private loans and I have used private money for decades. And uh, it always pains me to hear folks tell their horror stories of private lender deals going wrong. And in many instances, those private lender deals that went wrong could have been uh, addressed, the issues could have been avoided uh, beforehand. So I'm doing this mostly as a public service because I, I, I hate the thought of people not doing private lending because they're afraid of what might happen when there are fairly straightforward ways and best practices to protect yourself. So let's talk about, well, let's start with housekeeping. Uh, I believe it's going to be a relatively small, intimate group, and therefore I am going to approach this the following way. If you have a question, please just go ahead and ask it. Unmute yourself and ask it. I have a hard time watching the chat and giving the presentation and trying to get people into the room. So the best way to, to ask a question is just go ahead and ask it. Um, but in the meantime, while you're not asking a question, I ask that you mute yourself. I am recording this for the Team Unstoppable folks who will be able to get access to the replay but I'd like to try to minimize the background noise if at all possible. So please mute yourself while you're not asking a question. But if you have a question, go ahead and, and shout it out and I will get an answer. We are gonna discuss, as I mentioned, private lender self-defense. And let me say up front, I was thinking I'm trying to find some really cool graphics about self-defense, but let me at least say that I am not going to teach you how to deal with an unscrupulous, attorney who's licensed and just goes bad. Um, because again, that's a fairly low probability event. One out of 10,000, it doesn't happen very often. And it would cover, I need to take longer than an hour to, to cover that. This is truly self-defense. These are the techniques, the simple blocking and tackling things that you can do to protect yourself that don't require a ton of work. They don't require a ton of prep, just in many cases, asking the right questions and knowing what your, your rights are. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here in this hour, 45 minutes. And then I will open it up for Q and A at the end. If you have questions about anything we've discussed and I didn't answer your question, feel free at the end to um, bring those questions to the forefront and we'll get them answered. Of course, I have to say this, Almost all of you on this call or watching this call probably already know this, but I am not an attorney. I don't pretend to be an attorney. I don't even play one on TV. I'm not giving you legal advice. I am speaking to my two decades of experience using private funds. Um, I've, in the last couple of years, I have been involved in uh, brokering transactions, just under a million dollars in private lender funds. I'd love to do more, obviously, but my point is that I see a lot of transactions, I do a lot of transactions, and I've heard a lot of horror stories. Fortunately, I've not been involved directly in a lot of private lender horror stories because I like to believe I do, do things the right way, but I've heard of my share and I want to try to help you avoid these pitfalls. However, if you have questions that require legal expertise, you are obviously going to want to check with an attorney. The good news is that if you do what I'm recommending, in states like Georgia that require an attorney to close it, you'll have an attorney ready to talk to you and answer your questions, namely the closing attorney. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the famous last words that I've heard 
kind of bouncing around with respect to private loans. Maybe some of you will recognize some of these. Don't worry, I won't call any names, but let's see if these sound familiar. Well, I've known Mary for years. I don't need all that fancy formal paperwork to do this deal. Well, what could go wrong? Um, or Bob or Jane or whomever. This one uh, is particularly painful because it may not be the case that Mary is not trustworthy or that she that something happens to make her not trustworthy. It may simply be life. Mary might intend to do all the right things with you. And then the day after you give Mary your money, Mary might get hit by a bus and be in a hospital uh, on uh, liquid food for the next six, seven, eight months and unable to fulfill any of the obligations she made to you when she was healthy. And if you haven't protected yourself, you're now stuck in limbo because she's got your money and you've got none of the protective paperwork that keep you from having a, a nightmare experience as a private lender. Joe says, there's no time to close with an attorney or title company. And I want to get in on this deal so I don't miss out. This is the, the speed imperative. Oh, you have to get this thing done real fast because it's only going to last for a couple of hours or a couple of days. And we got to get this thing done. There's no time to verify that the title is clear. There's no time to find an attorney to close this thing. We have to get it closed fast and put some money in the seller's pocket so that we don't lose this wonderful deal. Um, my philosophy on speed is if you have to have a fast answer, the answer is no. I, I won't be rushed as a real estate investor or, any, or a lender or anything else. If I don't have the time to do the things that make me comfortable, then my answer to you is going to have to be no. And I'm okay with missing out on some deals because haste does make waste. And when you skip steps, that's when things fall apart. And the last one is Bob's an experienced investor. I don't need to look over his shoulder to make certain the rehab work is being done properly and completely. And yeah, Bob may be a very experienced investor, but Bob's contractors or Bob's subcontractors may not be so experienced and they may not be so uh, scrupulous. And so you're not th don't think of it as checking up on or looking over the shoulder of Bob. Think of it as another pair of eyes to help make sure that the work that Bob thinks is getting done is actually getting done. And that protects you and it protects Bob. And so you're not hurting him. You are in fact helping him get his job done. So I, I put these up there because these are not statements that are made by people who are clueless. These are people who understand how real estate works. They're just pressed for time or they're relying on the relationship or they're relying on the expertise of the operator. And they're not thinking about all the possible scenarios where things go wrong through no fault of the people that you're lending to. Um, yes, there are some unscrupulous uh, operators out there, but for the most part, they're easy to avoid. It's the people that you know and love and have relationships with that in many cases can do some of the most harm because you relax your guard and you think you're helping out by not making them go through all the formalities when in fact, uh, and I typically will say this, I love you and therefore I'm going to do all these formalities because they protect me and you and our relationship, which is more important to me than any amount of money. So it's not, I'm gonna make you do all these formalities because I don't trust you and because I don't love you. It's, I'm gonna have you go through all this for the very fact that I, I love you and I value our relationship and I don't want anything threatening that. So let's make sure that we dot all the I's and cross all the T's so that we don't have to worry about this little deal impacting our friendship. So um, this is why I'm doing this because these, I will say errors in judgment happen all the time to all sorts of people. Uh, and it's not a, an unreasonable thing to have happen, but these are easy to uh, address. And we'll talk about that in a second. I'm assuming uh, that most of the folks on this call understand what a private lender deal is but I don't wanna to make too many assumptions. So I'm gonna walk through a quick uh, scenario here uh, of a type of private lender deal. And again, I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly unless someone has questions and I'll slow down. But I think most of you understand how this, how this thing works. And um, the way I've been talking about these deals is oftentimes the people who will approach you are people who already know you and who know that you have funds. 
And so uh, for the purposes of this example, let's uh, imagine a cousin J, which could be a male or female, uh, that approaches you and says, hey, cousin, which is you, I know about this great deal. The seller has a house and they're prepared to sell it for cheap. And I wanna jump on this deal. And so let's talk about how we can work on this thing together, says cousin Jay. I know that you have money and I don't have any. So here's what I'd like to see happen. Let's find ourselves a closing agent, could be a closing attorney, could be a title company, but for now let's call it a closing attorney. And let's do this the following way. You give a big bag of your money into the escrow account for that attorney. And we'll have that seller put the deed of that house into the escrow account for that attorney. And then presto change the money that you put in will be masterfully delivered to the seller. The, the deed to the house that that seller put into escrow will go to me, cousin Jay, and you, lender that you are, will get a security deed and you get a note. And we'll talk about those both in a minute. And everybody's happy. Now, I, 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 I went through that pretty quickly and, I, and I, I said it sort of sarcastically, but the point of the matter is, if Jay is paying you interest the way he should be and the deal is a good deal, there's nothing wrong with this deal. There's absolutely nothing wrong with what I just described. It happens all the time. And when it works, it works pretty well. If you had funds that weren't getting the kind of returns that you were hoping to get, then having a private lender deal to invest in is a great deal for you. Cousin Jay gets to do a deal without having to have a ton of money of their own. And the seller gets their house sold, which is what they wanted in the first place. So this is not a bad deal. There's nothing about this that we've just gone through that, that is bad. The bad parts come in when steps get skipped or people let their guard down and let emotions uh, get in the way of good judgment. So let's talk about what I like to call the four nevers. And if you remember nothing else from this presentation, please take away these four, because if you manage these four properly, you will avoid 90% of the risk that I've seen and that I've heard of when people get in trouble with private lender deals. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not talking about the underwriting of the deals. We're not going to talk about, is it a good deal? We're not going to talk about, are the comps valid? Um, is the LTV appropriate? That's a separate issue. I'm just talking about the, the mechanics of the actual execution of the deal. My assumption is that you'll do your homework and your due diligence and verify that the deal makes sense. And the deal could make perfect sense. But if you violate these four nevers, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And so I'd like to see you avoid that possibility. And that's why we're going to cover uh, these in some detail. Uh, and they're pretty straightforward. And most of you probably know them. The temptation, however, is to break some of these rules. And that's why I'm calling them the four nevers. You should never be breaking these rules. The first one is that you should never, ever be sending funds anywhere other than to an attorney or title company escrow account. And that one is a big one because if you violate that, all bets are off because now you have no control over where the money's going. It's in someone's hands, it's in their account. Maybe it gets seized. Maybe they have judgments and liens and someone sees that money in an account and grabs it. And now they don't have any control over it because it's been seized to cover a debt that you had nothing to do with, but it's, it was there and now it's gone. Um, the beauty of escrow accounts is that they are separate from that attorney's personal funds or that title company's business uh, funds. They are a separate account that is only for the purpose of doing these real estate transactions. And so they can't be seized because the attorney didn't pay their taxes or because the title company had a lien against them. These, this account is inviolate. And if the attorney or the title company mismanages that account, they're going to see bars, they're going to jail. Um, and in most cases, they're going to lose their license to, um, to uh, practice law or to be a title company. So they are going to be very, very careful about the funds that come into and go out of an escrow account. They have to account for every single penny that goes into that account and comes out. And that's why you want that protection. You should never be wiring funds or sending funds or paying funds 
anywhere than into an, a, an escrow account for an attorney. I don't care how badly the uh, investor needs the funds or how fast they need it or how well you know them. There are just too many things that can go wrong that in many cases have nothing to do with nefarious intent on the part of the investor. It's just life. Um, the attorney gets, I mean, the account gets, gets frozen or the, the bank goes out of business. There's a, there are a million things that could happen. Um, but if you abide by this first never, that will probably address half, if not 60, 70% of all the, the uh, nightmare scenarios that I see out there is when people break this particular rule and they wire funds to the, uh, directly to the borrower, which is a no-no. Uh, second is you should never fund any kind of closing without a thorough title search and title insurance. And the reason for that is if you don't do a title search and you do a hood of the car, car closing and the seller uh, gives you the deed and you give them the money, and then you discover after the fact that, wow, you thought you were going to be in first position, but there was already a first position lien there that never got cleared off. Now that first position lien that you thought you had is a second position or a third position. And that's not what you signed up for, but that's the way it's going to work because the title search was not done. The title search costs a pittance compared to the pain and suffering it'll, it'll prevent you from having uh, if you do it if, if you do it properly. So you should never even think about closing a transaction where you're funding the deal and expecting to be in first position unless someone has verified that the title is clear and that when you do put your lien on, there's nothing else there that's gonna get in the way so that you will in fact have a first lien position if that's the agreement. Um, and you want insurance and you want the borrower to pay for it just like they would with any other lender uh, because that's their responsibility. Uh, three, uh, it's somewhat related to one, but I, I see sometimes people wanna make an exception here Never pay anyone outside of closing. That counts brokers, um, binders, none of that stuff. Everything that you pay, should, if, you, if you're looking to protect yourself, should be handled in closing and it should show up on the settlement statement, formerly known as the HUD-1. If it, basically, if it, didn't show up on, if it doesn't show up on the HUD-1, it didn't happen. And you can't prove that it happened if it happens outside of closing and you're giving up the protections of having an attorney or a title company close it by paying things outside of closing. There's, there's no, there's no, I can't think of any good reason to do it. Maybe someone out there can. I haven't yet heard a good reason for paying something outside of closing. And the temptation is great to do it because, oh, it's just Bob, oh, it's just Mary. I know them, and they're okay. No, you want the protection of, of being able to show where funds went, where they came in, when they, where they went out and who got what. And so no one should be getting paid outside of closing for anything. Uh, and then lastly, and this is not as obvious, uh, particularly for uh, investment properties, but you should never be placing loan funds on an uninsured property. When you go to close your personal residence, your attorney tells you or your title company tells you in advance before you come to closing, you've got to go get an insurance policy and prove, you have to send in to the, to the uh, closing entity proof of insurance with the lender's name in the proper format on that policy so that the day that they give you the money, they're protected. Nothing is more terrifying than closing a, a private lender transaction and contemplating and not having insurance and then contemplating what happens if two minutes after you close, the house burns down or a plane runs into it or a flood takes place and you now have no insurance the borrower has no insurance and uh, your investment is in jeopardy because you did not require that they have an insurance policy on that um, property. So if you abide by these four, if you ensure that these four nevers are enforced, you will eliminate, by my estimation, at least 90% of the risk. Most of the horror stories that I've heard regarding private funds and private lending have been someone violating one or more of these guidelines and exposing themselves unnecessarily. Uh, and just for the record, if you are an investor working with or looking for, like seeking out private uh, lenders, you should assure them that you're never gonna make them or ask them to, to send funds any place other than to an attorney or title company escrow account. You're never gonna close with them uh, without giving them 
uh, title insurance and having done a thorough title search. You're never going to ask them to pay anyone, including a broker outside of closing, and you're going to make sure that you have insurance in the property before you close so that they're protected. Uh, it's just as much of a responsibility for the borrower as it is for the lender. But for the purposes of this call, we're talking about what the lender should do. But for those of us who do both, uh, just be mindful that having an, an eye and an ear toward uh, both sides is helpful because it makes people feel a whole lot more comfortable when they know that you're looking out for their interests. Uh, any questions so far? I know I'm covering this in reasonably fast pace, but I do want to make sure we cover everything. Everybody good so far? Cool. Okay. Let's talk about the, I guess, the, the way I'd like you as a private lender to think of your role in a private lending transaction. Uh, and I, I'll pick on Wells Fargo. It could be any big bank that you know of. Uh, the, the golden rule, as I've been taught it is, at least in business, is he or she who has the gold makes the rules. So uh, when you're closing with a closing attorney, the attorney, in theory, I guess, is, is working for the, the, the seller and the, um, the buyer. But really, if there's an attorney, of, if, sorry, if there's a um, lender involved, there's a big bank involved, the attorney is really working to make sure that the lender is happy. If the lender is not happy, nothing moves forward. And so that attorney effectively works for the lender. All the paperwork that the lender provides, the attorney makes sure it gets signed and is, is executed properly. Well, when you're thinking about yourself in a private lender transaction and you're lending the money, you should consider yourself Wells Fargo, which is to say, if Wells Fargo would get that protection, then you should get that protection. Uh, that's kind of where my insurance philosophy came from. Wells Fargo won't let you close on the mortgage to buy a house without insurance. And if you don't get insurance uh, during the course of your mortgage, or if you let the insurance lapse, they will force place insurance to protect their interests. So at a closing, thou shalt not close without an insurance policy in place. Therefore, when you're doing a private loan, the same thing should apply. Wells Fargo would never dream of giving you money for a house that they hadn't forced someone to do a, a thorough title search and uh, provide them with lender's title insurance policy. Same thing should apply therefore for you. So basically when you're looking in, into a private lending transaction, if you don't feel like you're being treated like a big bank, then there's something wrong. Uh, let's talk about specifically what that means. Uh, there are five key documents in a private loan, and you should not leave a closing without them, either the originals or a copy. Uh, so let's walk through those so that we're all clear on what those are. The first one is a lender's title policy. You should be able to get the, it may take a few days for you to actually get the original, but some, sometimes you can get the original policy, but that's yours because you are the lender. And that should be paid for, just like it would for Wells Fargo, by the borrower. That's not an expense for you. There should be, they should be ensuring that the title is good and that they should be that you are getting good, good uh, title by providing you with a lender's title policy that they, the borrower, pay for as part of their closing costs. Uh, and you should be able to take that away or a copy at least of that away uh, at the closing table or shortly thereafter. You should be provided with a copy of the proof of insurance. Uh, usually the declarations page uh, will specify who the, uh, the, 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 ver the nature of the insurance that's there, as well as the parties that are insured. And you should be one of those parties showing up in the first lien position. Uh, if it's not exactly right, if you're holding it in an entity and the insurance is in a personal name, that's wrong. It's gotta be exactly right. And those of you who have closed in a house know that if you get it even slightly wrong, Wells Fargo will force you to get it right before they will fund that deal because they're not protected unless it's exactly the way they need it to be. Same thing here. Whatever entity you're lending the money in, that's probably who should show up on the insurance policy. You should specify who that is and the borrower should provide that at closing and give you a copy. And it should be effective as of the day of closing. It shouldn't be two days later, three days later. You don't want there to be any gaps in, in, in protection for you. What if it burns down right after you have the closing? It should be effective the day of closing. And you should get a copy of that. Uh, you should get ultimately from the closing attorney or, or closing entity uh, a security deed that is recorded. Now, of course, when you're closing in the real world, 
The document gets signed at closing, and then the attorney or the title company has to submit that to the county to get recorded, and that usually takes a couple of days. So you're probably not going to get a recorded copy at the closing. You should at least get a copy of the document, the signed document, and then the actual recorded copy will get to the attorney typically or the title company typically in a week or so, and then they should be sending you a recorded copy of that security deed for your records, um, just like they would for Wells Fargo. And that should be something that you can keep to make sure that it was in fact recorded, because if it's not recorded, then you're not protected. Just because you have security deed doesn't help you if they never recorded it. And so you want proof that it was recorded properly, and you want to have that document in your file for this particular deal. The promissory note uh, is the second of the two documents that create this obligation to pay and the, the uh, collateral of the house to, to protect you. And uh, the original note is the lender's. It's yours to keep. So uh, the signed version of that promissory note that's signed by all parties, that original is yours to keep and that should be delivered to you by the closing entity at the end of that uh, closing. And if you're not getting the original, you should be asking them when you're gonna get it because that's yours. And then lastly, and this one is not as obvious, but it's pretty important. You're gonna to wanna to get borrower contact information, not just the actual borrower, but at least, at least an emergency contact. Um, why? Because if you're lending money out of state and you don't have physical access to that borrower and something happens or they stop responding to you, it'd be kind of useful to have someone else that you can pick up the phone and call in case that person's laid up in a hospital unable to speak. Um, so it could be a wife, it could be a business partner, but it should be at least one other person that you can reach out to in case of an emergency. And I would like to, to see the private lender have name, address, and phone number, at least for the borrower, if not for the borrower and for the emergency contact, just because things happen and people get in accidents and they get hit by buses and they get sick and they go into hospitals and they can't talk in many cases. Uh, and so you have no idea what's going on and you're, you're stuck in the dark without having any details. So these are the big five. Are these the only documents? No, but these are the main documents. As a private lender, these are the main documents that you're going to wanna have either copies or originals at the end of the closing. And again, Wells Fargo would get all of these. And so there's no reason why you shouldn't get them as well. And no closing entity should balk about you getting any of this. This should be pretty standard stuff uh, and everybody should want you to have it. Um, so uh, again, I'm gonna talk a little bit in depth to some extent about the promissory note. Again, this is I'm not gonna give legal advice, but I'm going to at least suggest that the of the two documents, the security deed is the thing. It's a pretty standard document. Every closing entity does hundreds of those, if not thousands throughout the course of the year. So the odds of them getting that wrong are pretty slim and they're pretty standard. Um, in Georgia, it's a security deed and they're 99.99% they're, they're times gonna get that exactly right. And they're attorneys, so they have insurance if they get like, minor items wrong, they can fix it and they can get it um, um, corrected on public record. I'm not so much worried about the security deed. The promissory note is the second uh, of those two important documents. And the promissory note spells out in detail the obligation between you as the lender and that borrower, and not just the obvious stuff, but the things that, again, oftentimes people don't think about until it's too late. And, and when it comes to uh, private lending and, and these kinds of uh, arrangements, an ounce of prevention truly is worth a pound of cure. For example, uh, the promissory note, in addition to the obvious things, specify how much is owed and what the term is. And most, most attorneys and title companies catch all that stuff. That's, that's part of what makes a note a note. They're gonna catch those. Most will catch the late payment clause, but you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it says what you want it to say. Uh, how many days, if, if it's due on the first of each month, then at what point is it late? And if, it's, and if it is now late, what are the penalties? And how will those penalties be paid? Uh, those kinds of details should be spelled out in, in specific detail in the actual note so there's no confusion down the road. The borrower should understand what they are, the lender should understand what they are. So there's no, no argument when someone's late, 
we know exactly what late means and we know exactly what the penalty is and what happens if they don't pay that penalty. If they're supposed to pay a $50 late charge and they don't pay it, then what happens? All that should be spelled out in the note in detail so there's no confusion uh, and no delay in executing what it says there. Less obvious, uh, but also useful is term extension. Let's say you do a three month note and at the end of three months, they're not ready to pay you back yet. Well, if you don't think about this in advance, then you have to go and modify the note. You have to go find an attorney and start making modifications to the note, to the existing note, because you didn't take into account what happens if, you, if they overrun their, their term. But since we all know, you're seeing it here now when we're talking about it, and you understand that in the real world, sometimes it takes longer than the investor thought to get things fixed, you're gonna to wanna to put term extension conditions right in the note from day one, just in case it happens. It's a six month note. There should be a provision in there that specifies what happens if they don't pay within six months. Is there a fee that they have to pay? Are the penalties that they have to pay? Does the interest rate change? Whatever those are, whatever those arrangements are that you've agreed to with the, uh, the borrower, that should be specifically and explicitly stated in the promissory note. And who's making all these changes? Are you making these changes? Absolutely not. The title company, or the closing attorney is making all these on your behalf as the as the bar as the lender and charging it to the borrower. That's that's part of the, the joy of borrowing money is that you've got to make the lender happy because they've got the gold. So whatever those term extension conditions are, uh, they need to be in the note and to your satisfaction. You've got to give the thumbs up that it's okay before that thing can close. And so as long as you have that conversation in advance then there's no surprise, there's no ill will. Everybody understands what happens if, you, if it takes longer than the agreed upon term to get this thing closed. Um, this one is, I think, a little bit less obvious, but you've seen it before in your, uh, if you've ever had a home mortgage, that you know that the lender has the right, if for some reason they even think that they're not covered on your insurance policy, they have the right to force you to pay for an insurance policy that they select, force play policy, and you pay the premium for it. Um, and usually for, for private uh, notes, the insurance term is short enough that it's not an issue, but there's probably no downside to having a clause in here that specifies what happens if the insurance policy goes uh, unpaid or invalid or gets canceled during the term. What happens, does that trigger a default? Or do you as the lender have the right to uh, put a policy in place and charge the borrower, which is not a bad idea. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that you want to think through. And the good news is that once you've done a note or two or three, you start accumulating clauses and you will start adding things as you come across them as scenarios pop up to having your note going forward. And so your note will just get better and better and better over time. Or you can find someone else who's already got a pretty decent note and just kind of crib, just cheat off of their paper, that's, in, that's allowed in real estate, and use their clauses to inform your uh, loans. And so your note can get really, really smart just by looking at the notes of other investors. And you can make sure that you've covered all your uh, bases. And that's something that a good broker should help you with um, to make sure that you've thought through all the uh, promissory note clauses that you should have in there. And again, I'm not suggesting that these are the only three that you should have. I'm simply suggesting that these are three not so obvious ones, or at least one obvious and two not so obvious ones. There's certainly plenty more that you're going to want to have just to be on the safe side to put up front so that if there is an issue, you've already got it covered. It's already in your paperwork. And you don't have to amend anything, which is going to cost you money down the road if you have to change the, the note because you didn't think of it at the time that you uh, created it. Uh, so uh, I think those are the highlights we're looking at just past the half hour mark. Let me pause because I've, <laughs> I've been talking straight for about half an hour, a little bit longer. Anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Anything sound um, unnecessary or um, lacking? Yes, I have a question, Mitch. Daniel? Yes, so looks like this. Uh, this loan, this transaction that you're presenting is more 
towards uh, short-term loans, I guess, right? Yeah. Six months yeah. to one year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure about that. Yeah, and and and, and I only position it that way because the majority of the private lending uh, interactions that I've had have been for rehab or for buy, fix, and hold until they can season it. So we're talking typically six months, nine months, certainly well less than a year. Uh, but the, the the fundamentals I'm speaking to are independent of term. This would be uh, the, the case whether it's a one-year uh, or a 10-year or a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. It's going to be the same. This, you're going to want to take the same precautions and have some of the same clauses in fact, you might go deeper if you're going to have it longer because there's more ways for things to go wrong in a situation like right. that. Um, but yeah, um, but at very least, these things uh, should be taken into account. And it's not a bad idea to start, if you're thinking about uh, private lending, to talk to other private lenders who've done this before and ask them, hey, can I, you mind if I take a look at your note? Can I, can, are you willing to share with me uh, your note, just a, a sample note that you've got um, uh, so that I can kind of look through it and see if there's anything that I might want to add to my own? But 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 the note is where most of the opportunity to save yourself headaches and heartaches come up. And it's unfortunately where a lot of people just go, oh, well, the attorney will just prepare the note. And they will prepare the note, but they'll, they're going to prepare the standard note that may or may not have the things that you want in it. Much like an attorney might prepare a standard lease, uh, which those of us who are landlords know, there's hardly anything uh, that standard about a standard lease. You, you want a lease that's ironclad, double reinforced and, and uh, triple checked. And that's typically not what your average attorney is gonna pull out of their drawer and have you sign. So same thing goes for the note. You're definitely gonna to want to have access to the note more so than the security deed or security instrument, because again, that's something that they know, they can do those in their sleep. The odds of them getting that wrong are pretty slim. You're certainly welcome to look at it, but that's not the one that worries me so much. You're going to want to have that note before closing. You don't, you're going to, want to have plenty of time before the actual closing to review the note that they're preparing and make sure that it meets your satisfaction. Um, and, and if it doesn't meet your satisfaction, then you should be able to go right back to that attorney or, close, or title company and tell them what you want, and they should do it. Because again, they're working for you. Their job is to make sure that, that the terms of this note are satisfactory to the lender. In this case, that's you. Uh, great, uh, great point there. Anybody else have any questions? Anything that I said here? I think we're transitioning into the yep, into the Q and A. Um, anything I've said here that sounded a little bit off or unusual? No. Um, now I, I will speak to some of the things that I didn't talk about since we have a little bit of time. Uh, I didn't say anything about insurance uh, on the borrower, um, and I didn't say anything about insurance on the borrower. So let's say. You know, I have a, uh, a private lender arrangement with the borrower and the borrower does get hit by a truck and killed, heaven forbid. Um, if I had an insurance policy on the borrower, then, you know, I could perhaps, well, presumably I could, that, that, that policy would come into effect and I could get my stuff paid. Here's why I didn't mention anything about that for the purposes of this call. It's because I primarily lend in states or work with people who are lending in states uh, who that um, are fast foreclosed, to be blunt. And so, you know, I'll just be, I'll be very clear. If the borrower gets hit by a truck and the borrower's estate doesn't make payments, so if, if I find out that the borrower is hit by a truck, I will reach out to my, my emergency contact and let them know that this borrower has uh, owes us uh, money as, as per this, this uh, promissory note and the security deed, and that they have two options. They can continue making my payments or they can stop making my payments. But if they stop making my payments, I'm going to foreclose. And in Georgia, I can foreclose in about a month. And so I don't worry too much about having an insurance policy because my insurance policy is I'm going to foreclose if they stop making my payments. That's not true every place. Some places take you know, three, six months to foreclose. And so in those cases, you might consider having the, the borrower get some sort of an insurance policy. But again, to your point, uh, Daniel, because we're typically talking about short-term debt, I'm not too worried about it because again, if, if the term of the agreement uh, gets hit 
and they're not paying or not in a position to renew, then again, they'll trigger the default. And if I have to, I'll, I'll foreclose. But, but I don't want to be left exposed. And this is also the answer to the question why I don't broker transactions in states where it's painful or expensive or virtually impossible to foreclose, like California, like New York. I don't. I try not to, to get involved in deals in places like that because I can't, uh, when I'm brokering the transaction, I can't protect my private lenders because it just takes too long to get things fixed. I know that in Georgia, if my borrower doesn't pay, I can foreclose very, very quickly and fairly cheaply. And so I'm not too concerned about what happens if they don't pay. As long as the paperwork is, is done properly, I can enforce that paperwork. Georgia is a non-judicial foreclosure state, so I don't even have to file a suit. Uh, I post it for four consecutive weeks in the in the county newspaper, and then on the first Tuesday of that next month, it's getting called out at auction. And if I bought it right, 80% LTV or less, then I'm going to get my money back and then some, or my, more importantly, my lenders going to get their money back and interest and then some. So I don't I don't stay up at night worrying what happens if I have to foreclose. In some cases, I'd make more money, or my lender would make more money if they did foreclose. Um, so the lender is not hurt under those circumstances. And those are the places I like to lend. I try to avoid places where I can't protect my lender because that's a horrible feeling to know that there's nothing you can do in a situation like that. It's gonna take you six months to get the money back. I'm not saying you shouldn't lend there, but saying you should take into account the risks of doing that. And maybe in those states, you get an insurance policy or you get some additional security or you get some other way to protect yourself. But in Georgia, in Texas, uh, in places like that where I can foreclose fast, uh, I'm not worrying too much about what happens if they don't pay because I can protect my private lender. And frankly, in most cases, the relationship is more important to that borrower than anything else. So they're going to pay my lender before they eat because they understand that if they ruin this relationship, they're never going to get another dime from that lender. And they're probably not going to get any more money from me either. So that will dry up all their ability to fund their deals. And that's going to make them want to behave themselves. So um, it is a quarter to six, uh, my time local. So uh, if there are no more questions, I won't drag this out any longer than it has to, but I just, I'll, I'll make sure that everybody's gotten their questions answered. If you have specific questions about a particular deal um, that, you've, that you're considering for me, obviously reach out to me directly. Uh, if you are looking at private lending and you just want to compare notes, I'm happy to share with you. Uh, some of the uh, notes, literally the notes, the, the promissory notes that we've used in the past. I'm happy to share that information with you as fellow investors. Um, there's no reason for me to not want to share that. Uh, everybody benefits by having safe, uh, successful private lender transactions and protecting yourself is a big part of, of this. So if you have an interest in that, by all means, reach out to me. I'm happy to share that information with you. And that's pretty much all I had. So if, unless someone has any questions about private lending, uh, then I'm going to uh, declare this a success. Uh, I thank you all for attending. Uh, again, those of you who want to reach out to me separately can uh, do so, but I thank you for your attention. And I hope that you will have, if you're looking at private lending, that you have safe, uneventful, uh, well-paying and high return uh, private lender transactions. And uh, just know that uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of private lending, obviously. That's why I do this training because I don't want people to not move forward out of fear. Just know that there are ways that you can protect yourself. They're not expensive. They're not particularly complicated. And if you do those things, 95 to 99% of the horror stories that you hear won't happen to you because you will be well protected. Uh, let me take this off of share so I can see your smiling faces. There you are. Um, so yeah, so if uh, no one's got any questions, uh, I will call this as done, and I uh, thank you all for being here to hear me ramble about private lend lending. All right. Thank you so much. It was yeah, really yeah. great. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Danny, thanks for showing up. Please, thank thanks. Beth, thanks. Hopefully it was helpful, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Take care.